In a nutshell, we are a year-old uh, space startup based in San Francisco. We're about 10 employees. And uh, essentially, we uh, are a satellite operator that flies payloads on behalf of customers. I'm just giving a, a quick overview here. Our approach is to host multiple customer payloads on the same rideshare satellite that's a 150 kilogram micro satellite that we buy from a partner. And we handle the entire space mission from end to end. So that includes uh, satellite procurement, uh, integration and tests, managing the launch campaign, operations, licensing, insurance, the in entire life cycle of the satellite campaign. Um, we're building uh, standard plug and play payload interfaces and software that enables our customers to have a proprietary, taskable uh, data feed from their payload to the ground. Um, but I'm not really here to talk about Loft today. I'm here to talk about my experience from the past year of starting a space company from scratch. So um, when my co-founders and I, who we were all working together uh, prior to starting Loft, got together, uh, we thought it was going to be very easy for us to get started come, and come up with a plan. We had decades of experience in the aerospace industry. We had worked at startups before, so we knew what worked and what didn't work. Um, we knew our customers. We knew our market. We, you know, we were smart guys. We thought we had it all figured out. And what we quickly found out is there is no blueprint for starting a company. And especially in space, there is no set plan. There is no script for getting started. We're talking an industry that carries lots and lots of risks, and it's not the kind of thing where you can have five developers in a room for a few months and have a prototype. Uh, space is a very, a very difficult uh, sector to operate in. So what I'd like to do today is share three non-obvious lessons, at least to me, um, from my experience in the last year of starting a space company. My goal is to make this as tactical and actionable as possible so people can really have a, have a takeaway. So item number one, and I think this is the most important thing that I've learned in the last year, and it's something that I would preach to anyone starting a business in any industry, not, not just space. Painkillers, not vitamins. What I mean by this is the most important thing you can do as an entrepreneur is be maniacally and singularly focused on solving a big, hairy problem for your customer. You need to be a cure for their pain. If you're not doing that, you are just a vitamin. You are just providing some incremental value, some improvement on something that already exists. Um, when we got started, our biggest question was, how can we help reduce our customers' costs, give them the tools to increase their revenue, and give them access to capabilities that they've never had before? That is how you add value. That is how you solve a real customer pain. Um, all too often, I see space companies and space entrepreneurs who are what I would call brilliant innovators. They are building uh, an incredible technology, um, an incredible solution, and then they go and look for a problem. Um, and in my opinion, those businesses always fail. So really, it's impossible to know if you're truly building a painkiller from day one. You actually have to go out and talk to your customers. So a year ago, I was at this conference with me and my ragtag group of uh, two co-founders. We were running around, chasing people through the halls, trying to take 30 minutes of their time so I could sit down with them and ask them the questions that I needed answered in order to know if what I was doing uh, was really on the right track. And to be honest, it was only after 20 or 30 full conversations with customers where I really felt like we were onto something. OK, number two, not all money is green. Uh, really what I mean by this is you need to be extremely discerning and judicious in taking money from investors, in deciding who you take money from. We are very lucky that in 2018, there's literally never been a better time to raise money for your crazy space company. There is so much uh, an abundance of risk capital flowing into to VC these days. There is uh, new VCs popping up all the time. Everyone and their grandma is an angel investor. And some of the biggest names in venture capital have already placed bets in space and are actively looking at the sector. So this is a very good thing. That being said, though, uh, you should not take money from just anyone who's offering it to you because you want to get things done quickly. There's really three things that I learned to look for uh, when deciding who I wanted to invest in my company. The first, is, and probably the most important, is you want an investor who can help you attract more investment in the future. And I would say raising money is a necessary evil. It's a means to an end, not an end in itself. But that being said, uh, it's inevitable that in the life cycle of a tech company, you're going to have to do a couple rounds of, of equity financing. That's just, uh, that's just the way things work. Um, 
So an investor with a great reputation and a great network or the means themselves to follow on and help you bring in uh, new quality investors in later rounds is extremely important. I'd say the second thing are a good, uh, is a good investor will give you access to customer segments or markets that you didn't previously have access to. And in many cases, this is uh, an international investor who can get you in, uh, in a meeting with people in countries where relationships are the primary currency or investors that have a subject matter expertise in a certain kind of industry and they're gonna help, they're gonna bring you there. Um, and then the third thing are the investors who have seen hundreds of companies who have been a part of lots and lots of companies going through this growth and scaling and sometimes even failure process. And they know the problems you're, ha you're facing now and the problems that you don't even know you're gonna face in the future. And when the chips are down and when everything has hit the fan and when things are blowing up, they're not gonna be judgmental, sorry about that. They are going to uh, get in the trenches with you, roll up their sleeves and help you get through the hard times. That's something that every company goes through. So those are really three things that I learned to look for in an investor, and it was only through lots and lots of rejection and lots and lots of meetings and a, and a couple funny stories that I could share later where we learned these, these lessons the hard way. Um, and, and I would also advocate really having a strategy for fundraising when you go out and do it. So in our example, we decided 50% of our uh, seed round, which we closed in, in the fall of last year, uh, would be allocated towards just traditional VCs, traditional venture capitalists. The other 50%, we wanted to access international markets through our investors. So we found uh, high quality, either angel investors or uh, specialized VCs or corporate venture capitalists in uh, the Middle East and Southeast Asia that have gotten us meetings with people that we otherwise would have no, absolutely no, uh, no way to get in touch with. Um, and just even after a few months, it's, that's been paying off in spades so far. Um, and then the last, uh, the last point, and this is something my, my co-founder always says and has been saying since the beginning, is to always be one step ahead of the status quo, but never two. Um, the opportunity you as an entrepreneur might be chasing, your big white whale, might be absolutely enormous. It might be a 10, 20, 30 billion dollar market. And the technology you're building may be the most disruptive thing that the aerospace industry has ever seen. But let's remember who the big customers are in this industry. It's big Fortune 2000 enterprises and government agencies. These are entities that are extremely slow moving, they're risk averse, uh, and they're slow to adopt new technologies often for good reason. So that being said, your, the ability of your customer to actually buy the thing you're selling might be two, three, four, even more years away. And that's actually totally fine. That's okay. It means you're onto something. It means you're positioning yourself to shape the opportunity, to have your voice in the customer's ear as they begin to do their strategic planning and figure out what, how they're gonna evolve in the near future. But let's remember these customers prefer evolution, not revolution. So it, when that's the case, you need to have what I call lily pad markets, or markets to get you to that big white whale, low hanging fruit, that maybe aren't gonna help you build a gigantic business. Maybe they're just niche applications or a handful of customers, but they're going to help you begin to generate revenue, prove out your concept, get traction and credibility in the market, mature your technology, um, and position yourself in a few years to be able to compete um, and have the ear of the big enterprise customers uh, that I mentioned before. Um, so those are my three non-obvious lessons for starting a space company. Hope that's been helpful and have a good conference, everybody.